Hey everyone, welcome. Uh, let, let me begin by pointing out that we've got a row of seats still available in the front. So those of you who are coming in now, why don't you take them so that even later arrivals can squeeze in afterwards. So, so thanks for everyone for coming. Uh, it's a real honor uh, today to uh, introduce George Dyson, um, who's uh, a really amazing speaker. It's somebody that I've been uh, pushing to, to try to, to land here as a speaker at UBCCS for uh, approximately the last decade and a half. Um, and uh, it finally worked out. So I'm, I'm really thrilled that he's here today. Um, he's an amazing speaker who's an independent historian of technology and a celebrated author. Um, and uh, this talk is of, of really broad interest, uh, I think not just to computer scientists, too, but to, to many of us here uh, at UBC. Uh, so it's jointly sponsored by uh, CADA, which is the Center for Artificial Intelligence Decision Making in Action, and the DSI, the Data Science Institute, uh, basically because these two organizations could be signed between them, which would them on to get the, uh, the, the thrill of having to George as their speaker. Um, the, uh, so I, I'm lucky enough to be the one who gets to introduce him, so I, uh, I wrote down some, some remarks here. Um, I, I, in trying to figure out what to say about him, I found that the blurb for one of his books, uh, I think, was a good place to start. It says, George B. Dyson was born in 1953, the years that Mil Mills Barrichelli first used to drop on millions of electronic computer at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, where Dyson spent his childhood perform experiments with artificial evolution and artificial life. He's been keeping watch on the relationship between nature and technology ever since. Uh, so my impression is that that's also a pretty good uh, entry point for the, the talk we've given today. Um, he's a local who lives in northern Washington and a uh, Canadian-American dual citizen um, with really eclectic interests. How eclectic? Um, he's, among other things, famous uh, for uh, having uh, helped to revive the, I'll probably just pronounce this, but the Bear Darka, which is an Aleutian kayak made with skin stretched over a rigid frame. Um, he, he wrote a book uh, on this topic, which uh, became very popular. And he and his father are also the subjects of a, a dual biography called The Starship and the Canoe. Uh, he's written other books that describe the origin of digital computers and the, the connection of, uh, of this origin with the Manhattan Project and also told the true story of a 1950s rocket program that was powered by exploding nuclear bombs. Uh, if that's uh, not enough, he's widely sought after as a technology a commentator, offering a link between social histories, behind technological innovation, and predictions about the changes to come. Uh, I've personally seen him at invitation-only events at Microsoft and Google, and I hear through the grapevine that also goes to events much cooler than ones that I get invited to. Uh, and uh, today, uh, we get to hear him speak about uh, how the future of AI is connected to his past. So I'm really excited to welcome to the Thank you. Thank you. It's great to be here back at UBC. I looked at my calendar. I haven't been here for uh, 12 years ago. I, I spoke at Triumph about that crazy space project for physicists. And 13 years ago, I, I was here to, to talk to the uh, fisheries about Russian American uh, sea mammal conservation in the 18th century. So good at to talk about AI. So, but a little deep history. I'm a historian. I always like to have a context for everything. So not that long ago, the end of the Pleistocene, 16,000 years ago, we were under a 1,000 meters of ice at this very spot. And then the ice quickly, in a very short time, melted. So 13,500 years ago, Vancouver starts to rise out of the ocean and Point Grey is this peninsula that has the sort of weight of the ice you take the ice away, then the land actually floats up. Uh, and the end of the Pleistocene in uh, computing was the IBM 360. That was sort of the end of the, of the big, you know, the vacuum tube era where we came into modern uh, timeshare. And this, these slides are from Jason uh, Hall's retirement. So I came here in 1970 at that, at that exact time. Mm -hmm. Uh, Jason's wedding. I was I'm in, a, in a dark blue coat. I was just turned 17. And Jason got hired to run the UBC uh, computing 
that were pursued. That time, the entire campus was dumb timeshare terminals running off the IBM 360 with four megabytes of core memory for the whole campus. <laughs> so just to put that in perspective, and it was a, a struggle to keep that whole, I think, keep that whole thing running all the time. Some of the pioneers here did very well at it. So I had not much use that. I went off working on boats that's beyond the Sonic, but we did anything. We carried anything anywhere. This is a goat we carried around the Revelation Sound. Uh, and I spent a lot of time in Vancouver Harbor, particularly Belcaro Park, where there was a lodge. To tell you a long story that involves a murder of how that, that was the Tlaywatooth village site, how it became a private lodge. Uh, and I started living there and built a treehouse. 95 feet up. We're, we're getting to the computing part. So <laughs> I lived up there, and I had dropped out of high school. But thanks to uh, you know, some, a board that I split from the treehouse, so you, the deep sense of history. You know, I built the house in 1972. If you count the rings, it goes back to 544 years, 1426. So I became very interested in Northwest Coast history. And Jason let me use his UBC library card. So about once every two weeks, I would paddle over to Deep Cove, catch the bus out to UBC, borrow Jason's car, go get a, another backpack full of books, and go back to the treehouse and read them. Mostly Northwest Coast voyages. That's where I, where I learned all my sort of Russian American history. But one time, for some reason, I, I was interested in what von Neumann had done. So I also took out von Neumann's complete work, the volume of his complete works that was computing. And in that, there's this one paper on probabilistic logics and the synthesis of reliable sure. organisms from unreliable components. I became somehow obsessed with that particular paper, is how you can build reliable machines out of unreliable parts, which explains, that's really what von Neumann did in game theory was the same thing, and they were trying to explain how dumb, how the dumb people in the stock market so we can run an intelligent economy. And I took that and, and wrote this one page sort of manifesto in, in 1980. And that, that became the basis for much of the work of the rest of my life. So it all, you can find it all in that sort of one thing I kind of wrote in the, right after I left the treehouse. You know, Darwin on the machines, Turing's cathedral, we're all, and, which gets to the point that, that if you want to work in AI, it's important to recognize the past or else you will sort of repeat it. And, and Stan Ulam, who was Von Neumann's sort of closest working partner, had a high cost that would be borne by the taxpayers, and now you would say at a high cost that would be borne by the shareholders. So Stan and Francoise came, they were among the many people who came out of Europe in the 1930s to America and built the, the whole industry, which, which if you take it back to sort of the very beginning in English, it goes back to the story of Roger Bacon, which was, so he was the AI pioneer in the 13th century who tried to build a speaking brass head. And most of the story, most of the AI stories, and still today, they usually don't end well. This one particularly doesn't end well. Uh, so they try and build this, you know, this AI, and they were you know, far from perfection of the work as they were before, that at last they concluded to raise a spirit and to know of him that which they could not attain to by their own study. So they did what most people do in the end, they make a deal with the devil to get this thing to work. And then at the end of this talk, I'll tell you what, what happened, but it didn't, it didn't end well. And Thomas Hobbes, was the first to sort of rigorously show that, that you could do all the functions of, of sort of logic, the operations of mind could be done with binary arithmetic. And he also developed the idea we would now sort of call social networks, networks of agents. And that why may we not say that all automata have an artificial life. So that's like the first use of artificial life in the English language. Leibniz working in Germany makes this much more sort of methodical a whole. That's his vision of an entire digital universe where everything is done with 
binary computing, and he has an idea that's ex hugely prophetic to build a machine that doesn't use wheels, it uses tracks and switches, and you run black and white marbles down these tracks, and then he showed how you, if you can shift these columns, you can do all the functions of arithmetic. So he effectively invented the shift register, which is what makes at the heart of all modern microprocessors is exactly what Leibniz envisioned, except instead of tracks, it's, it's conductors, and instead of a gravity gradient, it's a, it's a voltage gradient. But otherwise, it all works the same way, it's very, very fast. Charles Babbage sort of took a great step backwards and tried to do it all with wheels with his collaborator, uh, Ada Lovelace, who you know, is famous for this statement, sort of, that she, I've converted the infinity of space, which was required by the conditions of the problem, into the infinity of time. That's effectively the, the invention of software, that by programming the machine on cards, you had enough cards, you could effectively do the work of any arbitrarily large machine with a smaller machine if you simply have more time. Samuel Butler, who was probably most articulate and really envisioning where this would go, he goes, he gets sort of in trouble with his father, who's a preacher and his grandfather is also in the church. They say, you either, you either have to join the church, uh, join, become a lawyer, or leave England. And he chooses to leave England. He goes to New Zealand, where he, he gets a copy of Darwin's Origin of Species, goes off and he's herding sheep for a living, but reads it and writes this amazing letter to the editor, Darwin Among the Machines, explaining where this whole, you know, Darwin's theory will go when it takes over the world of machines. Why may there not be, arise some new phase of mind which will, shall be as different from all present known phases as the mind of animals is from vegetables. And there was a time when fire was the end of all things. There's no security against the development of mechanical consciousness in the fact of machines possessing little consciousness now. So we're still at that state of, well, how do we know? And, and uh, it's, it's still the big debate. Alfred Smee one of the first people to sort of introduce electricity into this problem, that you, you know, instead of doing it with wheels, how about doing it with, uh, with electricity? And also, he starts out trying to, not to explain consciousness, but at least to define it. And I think Alfred Smee's sort of 1849 definition of consciousness is as good as anything we have uh, today, which is that there, there are images that are reality, and there's images that are imagined, and that our thoughts and the power to distinguish between thought and reality is consciousness. That's, that's still as good as anything anyone's come up with since. But that doesn't explain it. That just simply defines it. To explain it, he looked at what we would now call sort of neural networks uh, and even, in a way, deep learning, where you have hidden layers in the network and you're, you're doing pattern recognition. Again, in 1850, very far sort of ahead of his time. He also writes a paper inventing a search engine, a machine that can, can find the relations and differences between any arbitrary concepts or words. The problem is that he calculates what it would take to build this machine would have to be the size of London. Uh, he didn't, what he didn't have was electronics. That was sort of the missing thing. So uh, John Ambrose Fleming, is looking at problems in the physics. Things always get interesting when you have a problem. That's sort of where, when you make progress is when, when you have something you can't explain. So if you look at an electric lamp, the light radiates evenly, you know, symmetrically in all directions, but there were some unidentified particles within the ball that were going asymmetrically. And we now know that, we soon knew that they were electrons, but we didn't know that then. So Fleming, who was a, very religious anti-Darwinist. He believed Darwin was corrupting the youth and uh, was a very strong creationist. So people who tell you that, that you know, progress in science is incompatible with religion are completely wrong. I mean, Fleming was one of a, a long line of people who made huge progress in science and technology but were deeply um, religious about it. So he invents what, what effectively is a vacuum tube, a valve that uses that a asymmetry to, to make what we in modern life would be a diode, and lead the forest makes a triode by putting a third electrode 
out of bent wire that became known as the grid. So this still, even the transistor today, has the grid survives as the third uh, controlling electrode. Lewis Richardson, who was also, he was a Quaker, a very strong pacifist, he was trying to solve the problem of numerical weather prediction by dividing the entire planet up into a grid and then solving the hydrodynamic equations, partial differential equations between cells. And this would take an enormous amount of computing power. So he's, he's doing this in World War I and calculates it to, if you had a, this is a giant stadium, these are galleries of hundreds of people in each, of mathematicians in each gallery. So he decided you needed 64,000 mathematicians. Then you could actually do the numerical hydrodynamics faster than the weather itself, and you could start predicting the weather. And that seemed impossibly ambitious, but of course it's what we do today. It's why we get, we have a good seven-day forecast is we actually do that. Raw horsepower. He also, I think, everything you need to know, know about the true future of AI is on this slide. This is an <laughs> electrical model illustrating a mind having a will but capable of only two ideas. So it's a non deterministic circuit. P and Q are detectors of sort of quantum noise in the universe, they're unpredictable. Yet it stabilizes into one state or the other. So it has, it has free will, but it's only capable of two ideas. And I think the future lies in machines that, that are large networks of these. We, I don't think we have a name for this component, but it should, you know, it should be called the Richardson or something. It's effectively a non-deterministic transistor. Uh, Alan Turing comes, so if, if you look at, in my view of the history of computing, there's an Old Testament and a New Testament. And the prophets of the Old Testament were, were Leibniz and Hobbes. And then the, the prophets of the New Testament were Alan Turing and, and John von Neumann and, and uh, Claude Shannon and Robert Wiener. So Alan Turing is trying to, is puzzled by this mathematical problem called the Entscheidung's problem. And a point, sort of general point I'm, I'm trying to make in, the, in the, this whole story is how important the link was between pure abstract mathematics and the implementation of, of modern computing. So, the Einstein's problem that very few people were interested in. When he published this paper, he complained to his mother, he writes a letter to his mother, that only two people asked for copies of the paper. You know, wrote for a reprint. You couldn't get it on the internet at that time. You had to write and get a copy. Two people asked for it. He was in America at that time. So the Einstein's problem is the, the sort of abstract question of whether is there any systematic way by looking at a string of code to tell whether it is a true formula or not. And, and David Hilbert believed the answer was yes, and Alan Turing believed it was no. And he proved it was no by this, by sort of invoking a computing machine, the Turing machine, that, that of course in the universal sense it can do anything that any other Turing machine can do, and then manages to prove that, that one thing that this machine that can do anything cannot do, it cannot solve the insider's problem. But it also, the point of this was that any single machine can compute any computable sequence, which seemed to have no sort of value in the real world except then World War II came along and the Germans were encrypting their messages to the uh, submarines with the Enigma machine. And suddenly Alan Turing's ideas became very important in breaking those codes and sort of reverse engineering, building a single machine that could imitate the sort of astronomical number of possible states of the Enigma machine that was uh, doing the encryption. So they built, built if you've seen the film about Alan Turing, the, uh, the imitation game has pretty good reconstruction of these machines. And then a more important machine that came in sort of later, later in the war, the Colossus, which actually had vacuum tubes. So it's the first machine running at the speed of light rather than the speed of sound. And it's comparing the, uh, the messages to the various possible keys to sort of narrow down the code space. And they managed, by the end of the war, they were breaking most of the, uh, the Germans started changing the keys every day, but they were still breaking them within 24 hours. So Alan Turing had come to America to, they didn't know what to do with him at Cambridge. There's so nobody else, he said, you should go to Princeton and work with Alonzo Church. But already, Alan Turing was bored 
with Turing machines, just as von Neumann was very quickly bored with von Neumann machines. And they sort of got stuck with them for the rest of their life. But they already, Alan Turing wanted to build non-deterministic machines. So his thesis was systems of logic based on ordinals. And in here, what he designs in this paper are oracle machines, machines that are behave deterministically for a certain number of steps, and then they do something non-deterministic. And he believed very strongly this was this was the real path to true AI. You had to have non-deterministic machines. And we still are, are sort of slowly getting back to that. That, that in fact you can almost make a proof that that the machine cannot be intelligent until it sort of learns to make mistakes. So he insisted when he worked as a consultant on with Ferranti on the first computer you could actually buy, the Ferranti Mark I. One. one of his uh, things he would not give up on was it had to have a, a true source of random numbers from quantum noise on the motherboard of the machine, which Intel, I think, only delivered for us in 2013 or something. So he was very aware that you needed, you, you know, you couldn't, he as a code breaker knew you couldn't depend on pseudo random numbers. You needed real uh, random noise. What he was interested in was less what he calls ingenuity, that sort of horsepower, but he was interested in, in intuition. How do you get artificial machines that can actually uh, make sort of unpredictable guesses? So of these four prophets, you know, Turing's, they all had four questions. And Turing's question was whether machines could think. But Neumann came along and sort of, sort of took all of Turing's ideas and ran with them. And his question was what it would take for machines to begin to self-reproduce. And Claude Shannon, the, the third of the four, his question was how could machines communicate reliably against an arbitrary amount of noise? And so nothing we do today would work you know, without Shannon's sort of what he taught us about error correction. And Norbert Wiener, who was always causing trouble, and his question was what it would take for machines to take control, which still today is probably the deepest of, of all the questions. So if Neumann shows up, he understands what Turing was trying to do, but, but Turing's model was one dimensional. You had a tape, and the computer had to, the tape had to go back and forth in a linear way through the computer. It wasn't fast enough to do what von Neumann wanted to do, which was hydrogen bomb calculations and hydrodynamics. So he decided to make, in a very coherent way, to make von Neumann's machine have a two-dimensional memory, a matrix memory, the stuff we still use today. But from the machine's point of view, you could still consider the entire outside world as a long paper tape. And there was a tremendous argument among historians, did von Neumann use Turing's ideas or not? And one way to answer that is to go to von Neumann's library, which is still there, the library that his engineers used, and the entire set of the Proceedings of the London Mathematical Society are on the shelves in mint condition, untouched, except one volume, the volume with Turing's paper. And it's completely uh, been torn apart by the engineers. They didn't have, they couldn't copy it or make a PDF. They just kept going back to the library and looking at it. Now, Willis Ware was the fourth of the of the sort of original six engineers, and that's the he's explaining the Neumann architecture, the famous sort of the central processor, the memory, the input output, and may I still think the sort of most knowledgeable, eloquent statement to the argument of, you know. Did von Neumann deserve all the credit or not? Well, he was in the right place at the right time, with the right connection to the right idea, and we'll never resolve whose ideas they really were. Lots of people, even beyond Turing, were having those ideas. Von Neumann was the guy who, the most important thing he had, he had access to the money. He had, his father was an investment banker. He loved the military. He had no trouble just going into the various Air Force, the Army, and just asking for the money and getting it, usually with no paperwork within few days. That's his family in Budapest. There he is with, with Bernard Lowe Brown. And he also had access to Kurt Gödel. I think a lot of the ideas that made his, his sort of classic von Neumann machine work so well was, the, was Gödel's idea of storing logical statements with a numerical address and then manipulating the addresses with arithmetic and then outputting the logical statements. And that's, that's effectively what von Neumann did. Gurley gets not enough credit for it. 
So he didn't build the computer, but what he did was he built the group of people who built it. He had the ability to get all these people who otherwise didn't want to work together to work together and get the machine done. It was a very fertile, this is Princeton in the 1930s, uh, a New Year's drinking party. And all the people in that room were, they're all Hungarians except two. H.P. Robertson, who was from uh, the west coast of Washington, from Aberdeen, Washington. And it was actually, he was teaching particle physics to Alan Turing at the time. So it was this very small world where all these, all these people were actually going to the same parties and, and intimately, sometimes too intimately involved with each other. And so, so it wasn't an accident that this sort of Turing's and my mother's ideas got so mixed up. And then the, you know, when the war came, when Turing went back to England to work on the uh, decrypting, the, all the Princeton physicists went to Los Alamos to work on the bomb project. People like Richard Feynman, who was a graduate student, had the job of when Los Alamos, they knew they had computing problems with it, so they ordered one of everything that IBM made at its ship. Um, and IBM still had rules, you, you couldn't, only IBM technicians could you know, hook this stuff up, but, but Feynman went in, just broke open the crates and got it all working. Stan Ulam, who, who sort of did everything with von Neumann, and that photo was taken by Nick Metropolis. How many of you here use, still use the Metropolis al algorithm for uh, Monte Carlo? So Nick's the guy who, who put that together with Clary. There's always a woman who's left out of the story, but it was Nick and Clary von Neumann who, who developed that. And so that's when but not even made the statement that he's thinking about something much more important than bombs, but thinking about computers. So after the war, none of these people wanted to go back and, you know, back to academic, uh, sort of pure logic and pure mathematics or pure physics. They wanted to build things, and computers were the next big thing. That, in America at that time, the British were way ahead with their uh, Colossus. They had 10 copies of the Colossus. We had one copy of the ENIAC, which was a much less powerful, uh, but in some ways more general machine. Even the maintenance manual was secret. A huge mistake to keep this. The, the mistake the British made was keeping computing secret after the war. We publicized it. That's the very first flowchart for the first uh, Monte Carlo problem run in 1947 on the ENIAC. And all that work was done by Clary, which was, a, again, a miracle, miraculous action of history that when everyone else went off to the war, she was left. Uh, alone in Princeton, with nothing to do, and needed something to do. She went. She got a job in the office for population research at Princeton University, doing statistical models of population. What would happen to Europe after the war? How could the Jewish population rebuild? Questions like that. So it seemed a very sort of unconnected thing to do, but. It, Everything that she learned there is what made Monte Carlo work. Look at how they did Monte Carlo. They would, they would census the population every 100 generations and look at whether the neutrons were, were reproducing as fission or dying out by being attenuated by the tamper they would put around the uranium. So what, what she had learned during population actually made, as I hear she explains how, she just was the lucky person, just happened to be there when Johnny got this, you know, the idea machine running and needed somebody to code it. So she was one of the first coders in the new occupation, which is quite widespread today. And then she and Johnny put, went all across the country. So they, they drove back and forth you know, 28 times by car from 1946 to 1955 with no air conditioning or FM radio or anything like that. And they sort of spread this gospel to all the other places that computers were being built. Johnny and Clary would show up and explain how you know there were no operating systems, there were no compilers, there was none of that. It was just raw uh, machine language. In, and all this was being done in five kilobytes. The Princeton machine had five kilobytes of memory. A few machines got a little larger, but mostly it was all done by five kilobytes. And she got a visa and clearance. All, many of the people working on that project would not, under American rules today would not uh, so Clary personally ran most of the early big hydrogen bomb problems. So this is running on the ENIAC, and this problem will run for six weeks just to get the answer of whether the given design will, will work or not. 
would be six weeks of running this machine night and day, sort of compartmentalizing the, the calculation, doing a part, duplicating all the pieces, checking them against each other, then running the next step. And all that, in the, actually that entire, you know, like this, what you call now the source code, for that problem is only four pages. So a very small program but running over a long period of time. And the conventional view is that the women who did these calculations, uh, you know, they just did the arithmetic and it was the physicists who understood the physics. But if you read Clary's sort of never classified private letters, you find a lot of evidence and, and among the other women too, they completely had to understand it. They were left alone with the ENIAC for six weeks to run a problem. And here she's writing to Paris Mayer. It's clear that she, she understands the physics of the explosion they're trying to uh, simulate and has to change the parameter. That, you know, here she's saying, well, maybe you want to make the tamper bigger because we're, um, we're, we're losing some of the energy. And uh, so I think it's a different view of history. So she and uh, Johnny at that time, they only had that, they were running all this on the ENIAC, really miserably slow machine, although it was a multiple core machine. It's like, effectively, by modern terminology, you'd say it had 20 cores, but tiny little cores. So they, they wanted a bigger, faster machine. And there wasn't any, couldn't buy one, they had to build one. They went to Oswald Beblin, who had started the, was really the person behind the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, where von Neumann uh, sort of had his job for life, and, and talked Oswald into letting them build the machine there. The Institute, the director was Abraham Flexner, whose model was the usefulness of useless knowledge, and he said, okay, sure, you know, if it's needed for the war, you can do it, but keep it in the basement. And they had their first visit meeting at John Tukey's office, so, or, Dworkin's office of RCA, you can see on the list John Tukey, who got tired. At that time, they didn't have bits. They just had binary digits. And he got up at one of these meetings and said, let's, let's just call it a bit. And then after that, all the binary digits were called bits. And that in that meeting number one, they sort of issued this sort of like Moses on the mountain, the edict on the words coded the orders are handled in the memory just like numbers. There's no distinction between data and programming, and that was a, a huge difference. Up till that time, numbers were used to represent things. Now suddenly, numbers become order codes, and numbers are out, allowed to do things. And then, it's, uh, you know, sort of all hell broke loose, and the world would never be the same. But where could they do it? Um, they were given the room next to the boiler room in the basement, and then, but then for the sort of thinking workers. There was only one free room at that time. After the war, built, you know, even lumber was rationed. They got Kurt Goodall had an office 211 for his secretary, but Goodall didn't want a secretary. He, he wrote everything himself. He didn't trust the secretary. So that was the one empty room. No one dared to take Goodall's office, but the, they got in there, um, and that's where they had hired a high school girl, Akrabo. Conoprida, who was 16 when she was hired, she wasn't allowed to go to university. Her parents were Greek. Uh, but Herman Goldstein and von Neumann hired her, and she wrote, she typed all these early reports. Being 16, she, was, oh, she died just this uh, less than a year ago. And in there uh, is where the, sort of the great founding you know, architecture was laid down. She, and she explained to me how hard it was to, you know, to get all that type perfectly centered. You couldn't just you know, center a paragraph. You had to count backwards the letters. If it wasn't right, you, you know, but none of it wouldn't be happy if it wasn't perfect. <laughs> and, uh, and there's always someone who actually keeps a project running. And in this case, it was Bernetta Miller, who was the fifth woman to get a pilot's license in the United States. And then her eyes started going bad. And Frank Adelot, the second director, hired her. And she did a great job. She ran all the budgets and kept everything in line. Got, had a nursery school built so the kids would get taken care of, which is still, I think now there's actually a formal study that if, you can define the success of tech companies by whether they have good daycare for, uh, for staff. So here's the first budget. So one of the rules of this institute was no laboratory. It was purely an institute for theoretical think tank. 
but here's the first four dollars for electrical work. So if you look at that budget, they've been running uh, six months from November to May, and they've spent less than ten thousand dollars for the project that probably changed the world more than any other you know, project in history. For but not only needed a lead engineer, he went back to his friend Robert Greener and said, you know, who who can we get? He said, there's, there's one guy. We want Julian Bigelow. Julian Bigelow had worked with Wiener during the war on anti-aircraft fire control. He's one of the, the almost the founder of cybernetics. This is his daughter saying how you know, at the age of three, he took all the doorknobs off every door in the house, and his mom made him put them back. Um, he was my hero because he had he actually had an airplane engine taken apart in his living room when I, when I was a kid. We'd go over there. Among all these sort of useless theoretical physicists, this is one guy who really he worked on his own car. They brought in Vladimir Zorkin, who was the ran the big lab for RCA, knew more about electronics than probably anyone else, brought uh, television to America. And RCA was going to contribute this tube called the selectron, which is sort of like the when you find fossils of a dinosaur with feathers. It was a it was like a USB stick but all done with vacuum tube technology. So it's a 4,000-bit uh, discrete state memory all in a vacuum tube. And if, if they had got this working, the history might have been totally different. We might have enormous, you know, our, they might have monopolized computing, but they, they believed the future was television and not computing, and only like put four people working on this project. So, and so with von Neumann, they put together a proposal to build a network of 100 computers around the world that would do Richardson's dream of, of predicting the weather faster than the weather itself with these 4,000 bit tubes. Didn't quite happen. So they had to do what, you know, they had to build a machine. What I was rule was only use available off the shelf parts. So it was all done with uh, you know, Warsaw Plus vacuum tubes, things that we take totally for granted. That's an AND or gate. Somebody had to decide. This is how we're going to make an AND or okay. These are different models of shift registers. That's shift register design number seven. So they, they went through six iterations before they got the version that they used. And everything was built by a lot of the work is actually done by high school kids. And it was a 40 stage parallel machine. Everything had to be duplicated 40 times. That's the first working prototype shift registers of doing exactly what Leibniz envisioned, but with interlock, so each bit would move up into a temporary register, and then only when you confirm that the bit was safely there, so in a Shannon-type way, then you would bring the bit back down, so you didn't lose bits. And it was all done with 6J6 tubes. 6J6 was the cheapest, most common tube, and that was Bigelow's realization. You're actually better off IBM was trying to build computers with the most expensive tubes they could get. And they were like, no, you want the cheapest tubes, because that's what he learned during the war on sort of reliability of, of munitions. If you make more of something, it becomes more reliable. So it was a twin triode, so it had two triodes within a single glass envelope, so it could store one bit as a flip-flop. It's better called a toggle. They needed a the RCA memory was, they were still waiting for it. It wasn't working, so they did a temporary hack, which was, this is a magnetic recording wire running on two bicycle wheels. So it's the equivalent of a, of a hard disk drive. And they, they were able to get 90,000 bits per second input-output onto that drive. So all the original, again, the hydrogen bomb calculators were simulated on this thing before they got their high-speed memory running. Then they heard from Tom Kilburn and Freddie Williams in England, who were had got a machine running in Manchester that was storing bits as charred spots on the face of cathode ray tubes. If anyone can remember an old black and white television, you could turn it off, and you'd, like a minute later, if you walked by, it still had static on the face of the tube. So you're using the face of the tube as a capacitor. They used standard off-the-shelf five-inch oscilloscope tubes, they actually made a deal with the company who made them that they got all the output, so they would get a thousand tubes and pick out the, you know, the 40 best ones and send all the others back because they wanted them uh, in the perfect space. And then, so each, like the machine in was like a big V40 engine. There's 20 memory cylinders on each side, and each cylinder 
has this matrix that's 32 bits by 32 bits. So it's a kilobit in one tube, and the machine is running 40-bit words, which we didn't get back to until much later. So in with one bit of each word in a different tube. So if, if one tube, you know, if, if your car stops running on cylinder number seven, your car will still run. If your memory stop, you know, tube 36 stopped working, the whole thing stopped. And the big push was to do the hydrogen bomb calculus. They weren't supposed to talk about it, it was a secret, um, but that's a page in a logbook where the engineer is back to the bottom. So Robert Oppenheimer, who took a lot of public credit for having opposed the hydrogen bomb, that's, again, that's just provably not true. He strongly supported this project and supported the development. I've only much later did he sort of posture himself as having been against it. But Neumann sort of his idea was, well, you just got to play both sides, so we're going to build this machine that can destroy all life on Earth. And he sort of, in a way, tried to redeem himself by going into biology and looking at, could you use a computer to develop artificial life within the memory of the machine? Brought in Nils Baricelli, who in 1953 starts looking at, can you build evolutionary systems within this, you know, this five kilobyte digital universe what happens. He actually tried to come in 1951, couldn't get a visa. The Italians said he was Norwegian, and the Norwegian said he was Italian, and finally they sorted it out. The first person I know who really talks about the you know, digital universe being an artificial universe that, in which things can evolve, and he has a sense of humor about it. Started off by drawing random numbers from uh, playing cards and seeding his universe and then letting it run. So the bomb people had priority, but when they were done at three or four in the morning, Baricelli would come in and run these things the rest of the night. And he was a viral geneticist by training. He wasn't a, you know, he, he didn't come from computer science. He had a very deep sense of, and you know, remember 1953 is the year that we learned the structure of DNA. So he was trying to understand how the genetic system evolved in biology and thought that the computer could kind of eliminate, eliminate that. And as you realized you had to have diversity, so he started doing multiple universes and letting the organisms go back and forth. And it was way, way far ahead of his time. Here's his last paper he wrote, looking about whether, whether these systems could. But he would go, wherever someone built a new, faster computer, Nils Baricelli would show up. And sort of say, could I use it at 2 in the morning or whatever? He went to Vanderbilt. He went he was actually at UW in Washington for a year. And as Bigelow said, he was the only person who really understood the path toward genuine AI at that time. It would have to be uh, you know, a system that really captured the, the way evolution works. So the tragedy is that when von Neumann died in 1957, this whole project, Bigelow and Neumann had dreams of doing a, effectively a department of computer science that would use this machine for all sorts of problems. And then Institute under Oppenheimer was just vicious. And as soon as von Neumann died, they shut it down tried to fire Julian Bigelow, who wouldn't leave. So they said, well, we're not going to fire you, but we won't. We don't have to give you a raise. So he lived the rest of his life on $9,000 a year, raising four children and a, and a uh, wife who, had, who was in a wheelchair. So it was just a tragedy. This person who, who built this machine that created more wealth than anything else in the history of the planet was treated so poorly by, by the authorities. So here, 12 o'clock midnight, that's the last entry in the logbook. Ah, good night. Bigelow was so unhappy to shut down the machine. He packed it up and went to the Smithsonian. It's buried in a warehouse where you can't see it. It's really good. But the national, I'm speaking as an American national tragedy. But Bigelow was the closest link to what von Neumann was really thinking. So if you want to know what was von Neumann really thinking, the best thing is to look at what the very little that Bigelow wrote. But here I think it's a very coherent. You know, if you brought von Neumann back today, he would be horrified. Why are we still doing computing the, the crappy way they did it in 1945? And they were trying to solve one problem. It was not the most elegant way to do computing. And so Bigelow gives very coherent descriptions of that, how inefficient the, the von Neumann architecture is, and how inefficient the programming is. That you, technically, our programming is driven by having to create you have an instruction, a machine that can do, you know, a billion instructions a second, you have to feed it those instructions, and the only way we know how to do that is with, is with recursive processes. But there, 
there could be much more interesting ways of feeding physical problems into machines. We're starting to get to that with some of the, you know, some of the newer ways we're using computers. We're getting out of that sort of the, the track that the, you know, the sort of cheapness of the microprocessor brought us into. You could run uh, and with robotics and self-driving cars and cell phones and drones were being forced to sort of look at things more in that way. Can you actually map problems directly into the architecture rather than going through some huge overhead of operating systems. So if you look at what they did, they had five kilobytes of memory. They, the program ran for about 10 years. They worked on five big problems that were mathematically very similar but on different time scales. They worked on nuclear explosions which happened in you know, millions and billions of a second. They work on shock waves, which is what happens in the next few seconds when that shock wave hits your targets. They did a huge amount of work on meteorology, looking at time scales of hours and days and weeks, uh, predicting weather. All the modern meteorology came out of that group. And then Barrichelli, all more or less on his own alone, worked on, on you know, simulating the evolution of life. And then Martin Schwarzschild came in and did evolution of stars and galaxies on the scale of billions of years. So the, the scale in the middle is, is seconds in time. So it's 26 orders of magnitude in time. What's odd to me is sort of a, like problems in the physics of an electric plant. Why, why are we right in the middle of that time span? Why sort of an eight hour working day happen to be the middle of what is observable? What the computer did you know, in a very profound way, we sort of expand our, the human ability is limited from you know, the blink of an eye is the shortest to the human lifetime, and computers are allowing us to expand that. Uh, and the important thing at first was in the fast direction, I think equally important long term will be the slow direction. Things like, you know, real climate modeling over long scales of time is just as important as doing things in, in microseconds. So Bigelow was quite explicit that his machine was asynchronous. It had no clock. It just went from one instruction to the next. If things weren't going right, you could actually step at one instruction at a time. You don't need clocks. There's a difference between a counter and a clock. A clock keeps track of time, and a computer keeps track of events. That's a very profound thing. That's why the digital universe keeps speeding up, because the, you know, the, the, the sequences are going faster. Sequence is different from time. No time is there. So time in the digital universe and time in our universe are really two completely different things. When I went digging all this stuff out, I went to a lot of basements and uh, then someone at the institute goes, you know, suppose Oppenheimer claimed everything was thrown out, but it wasn't. Someone said, Mr. Dyson, there's another box that was found like in a garage you might want to look at. And I got this box and it was, it was like a scene in Jurassic Park. It had the complete set of punch cards for one of Baricelli's artificial universes with the source code. And, and this was a huge sensation. No one has done it, but to resurrect that system and let, like, let it loose on the internet. You know, it grew up, it lived in a world of five kilobytes. And it, you know, what if it had the, you know, gigabytes? So, and then there was a note from the engineer, Mr. Baricelli, there must be something about this code that you haven't explained yet. And that, goes back to Alan Turing and Newt Scheiding's problem that there is even a very simple code, there is no way of predicting what it will do other than to let it run. And that's a very important thing. And to me, to security people, that's sort of depressing. We can never have a totally safe system. To me, that's what makes the digital world interesting. All this stuff is out there that we cannot predict what it will do. And that's sort of like the real diversity in biology. So in these links between the fundamental mathematics that gave rise to computing, there's still leftover things that I think are not looked at enough. And one is the continuum hypothesis, which was sort of the other big problem equal to the insider's problem and, and, and other deep problems in mathematics, is this question of there's an infinite number of different infinities, but the continuum hypothesis states if it's true, that there only are two kinds of infinities. There are infinities that are countable, but infinite. And then there are infinities that are uncountable. And the, I could there's nothing in between. It's like if you go to conferences, at the end of a conference, 
There's only extra large and extra small t-shirts. There's no medium. And what's interesting about the Gitmo Hub is that we sort of are, are doing a demonstration for them. The, the entire digital universe is really a medium-sized infinity. It's an infinity that, in a technical sense, is countable. It's a discrete state that ultimately is a countable. Yet it is so infinite that it almost, uh, you know, if there ever was going to be a medium-sized infinity, we're building it. Yeah, but we still have not proven one way or the other whether it uh, exists or not. But in computing, the, the implication of that is that, that we have two different kinds of computing. We have analog computing and digital computing. And digital computing is countable discrete states. And analog computing deals with continuous functions that are uncountable. And in, in the continuum hypothesis, the sort of the best example is a line. And you can take you take a line, you cut it in half, half the line still has the same infinity, infinite number of points as the full line. And it's the same with analog computing. That even, a, even a very simple analog computing has this full power of the continuum that a digital machine, no matter how big one they ran. Now there's, provably there's all sorts of ways you can simulate any continuous function with a discrete state machine to arbitrary accuracy, but it's not the same. In a sort of good old sense of, of the two things are different. And, and all these people who were there at the beginning, they thought about that, and they knew the importance. And so both Alan Turing and Lynn Neumann, particularly Lynn Neumann, were very interested in how we do computing in nature. And one of the last things Lynn Neumann was working on, and he was very explicit that, that the brain is not digital. That there is no, you take part of the brain forever, you're never going to find a digital code. There's no sort of discrete state functions. It's, it's a quite different system. It's the complexity is in the topology and the uh, connections, not the, and so it's very clear that if we want to build these very powerful electronic computers, we're going to have to transform logic to neurology rather than, than the reverse. We've been pushing the reverse for so long, We're trying to make you know, logic into symbolic uh, discrete systems, and actually he, I think he believed in, in Time will tell, but it's actually better to go the other way. Again, very profound statement that you really can't explain a visual analogy rather than by giving a map of the connection. So if you look at Bonhoeffer, well, who's famous for the Bonhoeffer architecture, but never patented it, he, he does have one patent. And it's surprising me how little known it is that Bonhoeffer's one patent is for a completely non Bonhoeffer computer. And he sold it to IBM for $50,000. So, you know, figure that out. But, but so, you know, both Alan Turing was most interested in this sort of non-Turing computing, and Bonhoeffer was interested in non-Bonhoeffer computing. And lots of other people followed him. Uh, Ashby, who has Ashby's law that any effective control system must be as complex as a system of control. That's sort of the problem with software, that for software to be effective as a control system, it has to start becoming as complicated as what is controlling, and then, then you get very complicated. Software, but no, this isn't my name for it, it's law of sufficient complexity. The complex system constitutes its own simplest behavioral description. If you try, start trying to make a formal description, it becomes more complicated, not less. And the third law, in any system simple enough to be understandable, not be complicated enough to behave intelligent, while any system complicated enough to behave intelligent would be too complicated to understand. And that seems to people seem to take comfort in that, 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 well, you don't have to worry about real superhuman AI because we don't understand human intelligence, how we, we get superhuman AI, but it's a, there's a big loophole in this third law, which is in, it's entirely possible to build something without understanding it. Um, and again, all of this goes way back. So just take the one little excursion to 1958, the great conference in England on the mechanization of thought processes. They refused to call it AI. They called it mechanical intelligence. And Pandemonium was a system developed by Oliver Selfridge, who also worked with Turing. And there everything that you, everything that we're reinventing in deep learning is in this paper, the process by which can adaptively improve itself to pattern, you know, to handle pattern recognition which cannot be sort of adequately specified in advance. So it's done with layers. You don't need to know what the deeper layers are. Effectively, it's deep learning. 
And then you apply natural selection, sort of like Baricelli did, to run all these machines and let the, the better machines replicate themselves. And then Jack Good, who was Turing's assistant in World War II, and they, they worked on Bayesian, effectively Bayesian probability networks, but they weren't allowed to talk about it during the war. But, so Turing sort of laundered his ideas through Jack Good, and Jack Good published this book, which is Incident Statistics, a brilliant book. I mean, really, it's explaining what they did during the war, but they never talked about the war. And then Jack Good also wrote an early paper on ultra-intelligent machines. His definition is ultra-intelligent machine is a machine that believes people cannot think. And so again, a lot of Turing's ideas come to us through, through Jack Good. And also another profound statement that you want to build a really powerful intelligence machine, build it random, because it's random and large enough it will contain any network that will ever be required, which is how brains work. The baby starts out with an enormous number of neurons. You know, it's pruned down to the networks that do useful things. And that's, again, that's the secret we're rediscovering with, with deep learning. And also, Jack Good thought a lot about ethical machines. How do you know if these machines will be ethical or not? And he made the argument, well, they're just as likely to be more ethical than people as, well, why do we assume they're going to be unethical? And this, so this paper, a brilliant paper, it was published, but the published version took out all the good stuff and just published the boring stuff. And this is the unpublished version. I have a PDF if anyone is interested in machine ethics. It was very far ahead of its time. And then, also, everyone know what did Alan Turing really think about machine consciousness? According to Jack Good, he asked him, and he said he'd say so if he would otherwise be punished. That's a sort of very Turing type of answer. So if you look at von Neumann's notes that were left when he died, he was he and Ulan were starting to write a book together. It was going to be a big book about all machine intelligence, natural intelligence. And these are the outlines for the chapters. Turing, not Turing, that's all the things that Turing machines cannot do. Pitts McCulloch, that's uh, the power of networks. And then ULAM, which I think was this, this idea of a cellular automata that evolved. And there's Stan, who gets the last word, which is what makes you so sure that mathematics, he, this is a logician saying this, that mathematical logic corresponds to the way we think. He and Van Leeuwen both came to the conclusion that it doesn't, that actually thinking is. It is very not logic is sort of this way higher level process that, that evolves later, but fundamentally it's not at all logical. And that's where the, the title I talked back to analog comes from. That I think we're going back to analog computing in a big way that's not being recognized. The same way that we took after World War II, we took all this cheap analog hardware left over after the war, and we built digital machines out of it. Now we're taking all this digital hardware that exists and building large analog systems that are computing with, with just like the brain does, pulse frequency coding. And, you know, Facebook doesn't care what, whether your picture is a picture of a cat or a dog, it cares the frequency of clicks that, that it's connected. So it, the same with Google is doing, you know, so much of the computing is actually being done with non-discrete um, functions and where the complexity is in the topology of the network and not the underlying code. So the code and the digital uh, all stays there, but an analog layer is, which happens to be on nature often works out when things go into layers. You'll have a digital layer and then an analog layer. I think that analog layer is, is hugely important. It's, I think, what underlies these the sort of otherwise insane valuations of some companies that really don't seem to have you know, any great assets in code or structure, but they represent a, an analog network, and that becomes extremely valuable. So back to the Roger Bacon, they tried to build this AI, and nothing happened. They made this deal with the devil. Then, then the uh, researchers, the scientists, went to sleep, and they left their they had grad student Miles. He said, "You know, wake us up when the when the grass head speaks." And after some noise, the head spoke these two words: "Time is." And then Miles, you know. At my master took all his pains about the only two words had he watched with a lawyer as long as he had watched with the who had given him more and better words. He didn't wake the scientists up. And then the, uh, the head said, said something else, and then in the end it finally said, time is past. 
And he still didn't wake up the scientists, and then the whole head blew up. And I think we're, we sort of are heading in that situation today. Where everyone says, when are we going to have real AI? You know, wake me up when we get real AI. Wake, and you know, one day we will, and we'll all, you know, we'll all be just entertaining ourselves and, and perhaps not paying attention. So I think all these archives that give me access to this stuff, the miraculous thing was when, you know, when I dropped out of high school, um, I could never become a physicist. If I come here and say I'd like to do some experiments at Triumph, you know, no, sorry, gotta go back, you know, get your degree, then you can come do these experiments at Triumph. But the archives and the libraries, they well, history is one of the only academic fields that actually is reasonably open to contributions by amateurs. A lot of good history is done by amateurs. So I'm eternally grateful to Jason gave me the library card and all the other people who kept opening libraries and archives to me. And I want to say something at the end about which I'm always asked about what about the role of women in this, you know, in tech and in the history? And of course, I take it for granted. If my mother was a mathematician, a mathematical logician, my sister was a, in the computer industry, my daughter's a data scientist, so to me it's just natural. But it was tragic for a lot of the Clary, when Norman committed suicide, she's after Johnny died. She she was married four times, but she just never got herself back together and killed herself in 1963. And Turing may have killed himself. But a huge amount of the early computing was, in fact, you could almost say a majority of it, the, the real work was done by women who did not get adequate credit, but they did do the work. People like Hedy Selberg ran that institute machine, and Clary ran it for the first year, and then they brought in someone else. And my own mother came into that world. She got her PhD in, in Zurich in uh, 1947 and then came to America. And the first, the first job she got after leaving my dad was working on the traveling salesman problem for Remington Rand. We were trying to apply it to missile defense. Could you, how many missiles could you, how many airplanes could you take out with one missile? But they kept her in a cage, kind of like hidden figures. She was walked into a cage every because she didn't have citizenship or clearance. But, but as a pure mathematician, she could work in this cage on this problem. And then she was living in New York, you know, getting a dismal salary as an assistant professor at Delphi College, teaching first year freshman calculus and stuff like that. But her real interest was mathematical logic. Then she saw this ad. This was an ad, 1964 ad for a mathematician in autonomous theory, working on recursive function theory, whether the first order uh, theory of elementary algebra in which was monadic predicates decided was right up her alley. She was a group theorist, but okay. so she answered that ad um, for Hughes Aircraft. Got you know, got offered five times the salary she made for working three days a week, and got she had a 1961 Morris Minor and drove it west. And so that's you know, I wouldn't be here without. Uh, you know, and it's where your industry, so those of you who go into industry or whatever, and academia is so important because it, it does provide the jobs for mathematicians. But that, the other side of that bargain is pay attention to these crazy ideas from mathematical logic because some of them are still, I think, waiting to bear fruit. So that's it. Thanks so much for a really exciting talk. Uh, let me uh, pause for a minute here to let those who need to leave have a moment to get up and do that. I think we, we advertise this slot as going to 4.30, but I don't think anyone coming here can't get out. So uh, I think uh, once we uh, allow people to escape, um, we can have a uh, few questions. And then everyone might be interested to know that on the eighth floor of the CS building, uh, right after we wrap up here, we're going to have a reception that we're all invited to for the free food and the chance to, uh, to chat with each other and to food for the food. Okay, I'm just going to Do I see quantum That's a good question. And I have to confess, I'm a skeptic. And then, and then, kind of careful saying that, that group, the whole D wave. And, but I'm skeptic.
skeptical. I mean, I believe in quantum computing, but I don't see it as having a lot of practical implications outside of big government decryption efforts and things like that. I think it has severe sort of input-output problems. And what's, if you look at the pace at which things like these classical analog circuits being done on chips, which is amazing what could be done and is starting to be done, I think will, will end up having a bigger effect quicker. But I, I could be wrong. I could be like the person who said, you know, transistors aren't, aren't going to play out. They're too hard to make. Oh, yeah, thanks so much for a great talk. So as you were um, describing this like, tight-knit community of the uh, New Testament AI pioneers, it occurred to me that um, there's another smaller community of people who are thinking about this around, around the same time, so that would be the science fiction uh, writers, so uh, Ad Mock and uh, Arthur C. Clarke. So I guess I'm just wondering if, if their ideas had any influence in the minds of people who are Huge, huge influence. There's a tremendous cross I don't know if you know about Olaf Stapleton. He was a great scientific writer. He was one of the greats in the 1930s. And he, he was also Quaker, so he was in the same ambulance unit with Lewis Richardson. So Lewis Richardson, they would go for long walks between battles when there were no bodies to pick up or no wounded and talk about electronics and electronics. So, so yeah, in the, in the old days, and I think even today, so many of these ideas that became real came directly out of science fiction, of course. You know, robot itself came from Czech science fiction, particularly um, East, Eastern European and Russia's and fantastic Russian science fiction way ahead of you know, our. So, good, good point. Your, your, uh, your engagement with um, a cultural navigation in your early work with the, um, uh, your, your early study with the um, kayaks and so on, and and how do you how do you manage this? Um, do you see any kind of transference or layering between that kind of navigation in real world time and and where we are going in terms of these developments between the digital and the analog and culture? And yeah, there's certainly parallels. I mean, it's just, it's just different times. So I started with the slides of the ice melt. Some things take thousands of years, and now things can change in six months. So it's, the, it's the same, you know, process of change. I'm just wondering whether or not you have any kind of projection of of where this kind of technology is going. No, I, I try very hard not to make <laughs> predictions. I mean, people, you know, but I think historians are important because they they show you where you've been. And, you know, if you're lost in the wilderness, or if you want to not get lost, the important thing is always look behind you. See, and then you say, oh, I've been to this tree before. You know, you know you've gone in a circle. And there's a huge amount of that going on in AI. It's just, they try, when I go to AI companies, I just, I have to be careful, you know, <laughs> because people are reinventing stuff that was, that was done, done well before. And it, so if people want to read literature that's 20 years old, why not? Or like Baricelli's work, all that work of Baricelli was completely reinvented by, by people. Who, so I, I think you go to a place like Microsoft, it's, and I have lots of friends there, but I mean, why don't they have historians? They have so many other, you know, 1,200 people working on punctuation in Word. But historians <laughs> 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 can, can be, it's the same in the space. Right? I'm peripherally involved in the space business. Same way as a historian who points out, you know, the Russians did this in 1940. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. You didn't mention the Dartmouth conference in 1956. No. Any talk in history that I started? Yes, that's that's where in Dartmouth they had a conference in 1956 where all the great people showed up. I have a picture of it. All everybody's there, and that's when they decided let's call the field artificial intelligence. The British already called it machine intelligence, I can't remember the study. And then it was sort of a family feud ever since. Where, you know, um, I went to a weird conference last year, and, um, and Feigenbaum was there. And, he, and he, he was one of the people at that conference. And he, he came up and 
Really, I was almost afraid. Corey in the, in the check-in line at the hotel. I said, "You're on the program talking about history. What do you know about history right now? You weren't there. Why are you talking? Why did they invite you?" <laughs> And, and I said, oh, no, 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 I, I, I'm here to, to, to tell what happened before you showed up. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then and I gave my talk and made it clear that, that I, I would stop when we got to, when Ed Feigenbaum showed up, and, and he loved it. And, and, and in his talk, it was four or five times, he said, as George said, <laughs> you solved that problem, it could have been a bad problem. <laughs> The other thing was that there was a whole cybernetics community, like the Macy Company, yes. and Bateson and all that stuff. And there was a separate community from the Macy and I community. Yeah, they split and up. They spread off totally. It was just in dialectics. Yeah, it's the same with all Some of these disciplines have to be in biology, you'll have the same thing where group of evolutionists have. They believe in kin selection, they believe in group selection, and they won't ever talk to each other again. <laughs> <laughs> but it seems a shame because. The AI community lost all the communications and control information through yes. cybernetics. Very, we really very, needed very big loss. We started rediscovering them. And then losing the British contributions too was, was yeah. sad because the British had their own. Um, their own, own, own yeah, you know, beautiful set of oh, your machine intelligence that goes for a long time. I've got a question. And, I guess a big theme of your talk has been how uh, so many of the ideas that, that we're thinking about today and that we're excited about today have uh, historical antecedents or really just resurrections of old ideas. I mean, what, what if anything strikes you as being conceptually new about modern AI? Are there, are there ideas that you look at that you really struck they don't have historical antecedents? Um, I would have a hard time thinking of anything except just the you know, the obvious thing that we have, you know, we just have these amazing tools we didn't have before. They're all, you know, incomprehensible, but, you know, the level of, you know, horsepower we have. But, but uh, you know, as I said, I went to this conference of people doing completely new kinds of chips. And there I really saw that. I mean, the people had thought about the nobody had really thought about it. Person, and very exciting. That was, this was driven, this grew out of Sandia. You always have to be careful what people say, oh, we've got to shut this down. You know, Sandia is the lab that, well, it's almost designs nuclear weapons, but somebody has to build them. Sandia is the laboratory that actually builds that. And we sort of stopped building the weapons. So what do they do? They, they check them. And, and about every, each nuclear weapon has a chip. And about every 10 years, they replace those chips. They probably don't need to. But, so you have a, but they can't, they won't trust buying a chip. So they, they have to make their own chips. They have an entire complete Intel fab like that would be making, for Intel be making a million chips a day. And once every 10 years, they make a thousand chips. And, and the rest of the time, this thing was, and it's actually worse for it to, like a car, it's not good to not run. So one guy came and said, you know what, let, let's have a lab that does that looks at what we could do with the chip, and they did amazing things. So thinking about what you could do with that. If we just only think in a digital way, well, you can make these chips so you're going to make and or gates, and make more of it, worry about not making small enough, but you could, you could do all kinds of other things. A machine that can print these different conducting, so we're doing solar power, and you know, all sorts of analog uh, chips, which of course the military got right on, chips that can smell um, for fighting explosives. And things like that. So, so a whole lot of I think there's going to be a rich future in sort of doing stuff with these, these old technologies that work so well for, for making Pentium. Okay, just to follow up on your horsepower versus chip. So, more so, uh, density of transistors are kind of tightly. What's the relationship of that and uh, you know, horsepower in the future? Uh, well, I think the horsepower will just come from using. Like I'm not at all discouraged that, that we're reaching this physical limit in, in, in size. I mean, there's just so much improvement to be made in using them in different ways. And you look at what's being done with graphics cards and everything like that. Using, using the chip much more efficiently. Than, 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 and of course, also making them more three dimensional. 
because now we could just have these flat just because they work well enough that you can make three dimensional without making parts smaller, you can make them uh, three dimensional and get a lot effectively smaller. Yeah. I think we should wrap up here, I'm, in part because uh, the, the analog battery in the George Lucas <laughs> 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 we're, uh, Let's retire up to the eighth floor of the uh, CS building, which for those of you who are not in CS, is right across the hall. You can follow the uh, right across the road, so you can follow the corner people. So we'll uh, have some refreshments, and if you get your question out, you can. Uh,